Okay, so chapter eight, we start talking about confidence intervals. First, just a little background. We're going to talk about how we can make inferences or estimate or find out things about our population mean. So there's two different main things we're going to do in this chapter. So like na nationally, the average score on the ACT test was 21.1. The population standard deviation was 5.1. Let's suppose that researchers in Utah are interested in evaluating how their state is doing preparing students for the ACT. So they'd want to know if maybe the Utah average was different from the national average. That seems like a logical question to ask. So what would be the population that the researchers would be interested in? So these researchers said they were interested in people from Utah, so we'd say all students in Utah. And what would be the parameter of interest? Well, it would be the mean ACT score for all those students in Utah. So statistical inference is the science of deducing properties of an underlying probability distribution. Now when we say underlying probability distribution, that's just our textbook's way of saying the population. So it's, we want to figure out properties of the population from looking at our sample. There are two main ways that you can do this. The first one is estimation, meaning confidence intervals. And it allows us to address questions such as, what was your average ACT score for all the Utah students in 2009? Now, hypothesis testing is going to let us say whether or not that average score was different from the national average score. So in section 8.1, we'll do confidence intervals. Section 8.2, we'll do hypothesis testing. But we're going to start with confidence intervals for a mean. Again, here's all of our notation. You just kind of want to keep this in mind and memorize these. So remember, we talked about in the last chapter that our sample mean x bar is an estimate of our population mean mu. And we called it a point estimate, if you remember, because it was just one number or a single point. But instead of just giving someone a single point and saying, OK, our estimate is 20, that's just one point, what we can do to make it maybe make ourselves more confident that we're going to be correct, is we can actually construct an interval around our sample mean so that we're very sure or confident that this interval contains the population mean. So in this example, we want to estimate the mean ACT scores for all the students in 2009. We decided to take a sample of 50 students and find a sample mean. Let's assume that the scores are normally distributed. So it tells us that we're normal and our sample size is 50. So our sample mean, x bar, will be our point estimate of the unknown population mean mu. But remember, our sample mean is going to change from sample to sample. This is why we spent so much time doing all of that applet stuff. So if our sample mean changes every single time, unless we're extremely lucky, our sample mean isn't going to be exactly equal to our population mean, right? Because we had all those different possible sample means we could get. But it should be fairly close. So because we know it's probably not going to be exactly equal, that's why people said, well, let's make an actual interval. Let's tell people an interval instead of just a number. So first of all, what will our sampling distribution be? Okay, the sampling distribution of x bar is going to be normal because our original is normal. Our mean for x bar is equal to mu, and our standard deviation for x bar is sigma over squared of n. So just kind of reminding ourselves of everything. Now, I don't know if you guys remember the empirical rule. We talked about it just a little bit in chapter 5. It says if you have a normal distribution and you have your center, which is mu, or mu of x bar, which in our case is mu, okay, and it says if you go out one standard deviation in either direction, so sigma for x bar, that should be about 68% of your possible values. Does that remind you of anything? So about 68% of all possible values of x bar are between 
the center of mu of x bar plus or minus the standard deviation of x bar. And then we said if you go out two standard deviations, you'll be even closer. So if you go out two standard deviations, you'll be at 95%. So 95% will be between the mean and two standard deviations. And about 99.7% are going to be between your mean plus or minus three standard deviations. And in fact, we can use our standard normal table to find that for 95%, the exact value, so I said I'm above, about 95%. So if you do 1.96 standard deviations, you'll have exactly 95%. We could do that by saying, okay, I want 0.95 in the middle, so that leaves me 0.025 on either side. And we go to our table and we look up 0.025 as an area and it gives us negative 1.96. And this then is 1.96. So we said all of our possible x bar values will be within 1.96 standard deviations of mu. So if x bar is within 1.96 standard deviations of mu, then mu is within 1.96 standard deviations of x bar, right? So if x bar is so close to mu, mu also has to be so close to x bar. So to summarize, we have a 95% probability that our sample mean that we pick will be such that the interval x bar plus or minus 1.96 standard deviations contains the population mean mu. So that means, coming back up to my picture up here, if I was to pick an x bar value like right there, then it would be pretty close to my mean mu. But I might also pick an x bar value way out in the corner. And is it going to be very close to my mean mu? Okay. No, but 95% of the x bar values will be within about two standard deviations. So this means that before we actually select our sample, there's a 95% probability that we will obtain an interval, x bar plus or minus 1.96 standard deviation of x bar, that contains the population mean mu. Or in other words, 95% of all the intervals we might obtain if we took many, many samples will contain mu. And if 95% contain it, then that does mean, unfortunately, that 5% of these intervals do not contain mu. And this is why we call our interval x bar plus or minus 1.96 sigma x bar a 95% confidence interval for mu. So that was lots of theory. Let's actually try this. So we now take our sample of 50 students. So we know n equals 50. We find a sample mean of 20.3. and the standard deviation is 5.1. Let's find the 95% confidence interval for our population mean ACT score. So our formula, just from up above, and we'll make this more official later, was x bar should be within 1.96 standard deviations of mu. Or, since I haven't actually found sigma of x bar yet, sigma of x bar is equal to sigma over square root of n, because I do know both of those values. So our x bar is 20.3 plus or minus 1.96 times 5.1 over the square root of 50. And if we haven't done a plus or minus in this class yet, you'll really just put in your calculator 20.3 minus 1.96 times 5.1 divided by the square root of 50 and you'll get 18.9 and then if you do a plus instead you get 21.7 and in this class we'll usually write it in interval notation so we'll write 18.9 comma 21.7 so 
the 95% confidence interval is 18.89 to 21.71. So we just found a 95% confidence interval for my population mean mu. So instead of just telling my boss that, okay, my estimate for the population mean is 20.3, I'll tell him I'm kind of estimating this interval I think is going to be the population mean is somewhere between 18.89 and 21 point, wait, how did I get 18.89? 18.9 and 21.7. And so this is now kind of my estimate for what the population mean mu is. So I might say I estimate mu is between 18.9 and 21.7. So we're just a lot more likely to be correct than if we just say my estimate is 20.3. Now the problem though is that because we don't actually know the true value of mu, we don't know for sure whether mu is contained in our interval. But we are 95% confident that it's there. Okay. What we mean by this is we hope that, that our interval that we picked of our 18.9 to 21.7, we hope that that interval is one of the 95% of all the intervals that contained mu and not one of the 5% of all the intervals that did not contain mu. And we'll say that 95% is our confidence level associated with the confidence interval. So 95% is the confidence level. It's how confident we are. It's a percentage that kind of tells us how confident we are that our confidence interval actually contains the population mean. Now this number four, this is what you should be writing on every single problem that you do. Okay? Because I always ask you to interpret it. On the exam, I will ask you, please interpret it. So like all of these things I'm saying here are important for the exam. So my final interpretation will be, I'll say something like, we are 95% confident that my population mean ACT score mu is between 18.9 and 21.7. And then I might ask you something like, do you think it's plausible that our mean, the true mean ACT score is 21.1? And so you look at your interval and you're like, oh, well, 21.1 is in there. I'm 95% confidence between 18.9 and 21.7, so 21.1 seems plausible. It's in my confidence interval. So I say yes, because 21.1 is in the 95% confidence interval. If I'd ask you, do you think 23 is a plausible true average? I say, well, no, I don't think it's very plausible because it's not in my confidence interval.